Hi guys, it is another hot, sticky, stew pot of a day here. In the summer of 2021, it is, we have stumbled into Tuesday, July 6, 2021, I believe, here at Bugs in a Jar Farm, and I need to figure out what sort of planet nibbling to get out there and do today. I have so many choices out there to nibble a planet, and, uh, which is pretty much going to be the topic of today's discussion. Uh, you know, just trying to figure out which of the mainstream media articles to talk about. I'm just going to ignore the mainstream media the best I can for one day and uh, have this broken record rant for any of you who have not heard it the other 10,000 times I've had it or maybe have not understood it. I'm trying to uh, figure out how many ways to dive into this whole pointless overconsumption, overpopulation debate. So we're going to start with reading a comment from uh, not so alert tribes member Pass Ninify. <clears throat> Take it away. P A S nine A F I. Sam. I love you, man, but overpopulation, while a huge problem, is just the rich world's way of diverting blame. Poor people do not fly, overconsume. We'll get that in a minute about over poor people do not overconsume. Drive huge vehicles or live in oversized houses that use electricity if they even have access to reliable electric power. Okay, so the thesis here is overpopulation is just the rich world's way of diverting blame. And here's the short answer, then we're going to expand upon this. This is my short answer to that statement, and then we're going to uh, wind, we're going to fire off into my broken record rant about planet eating versus planet nibbling. At first, tell that to the lemur who just got boiled in the stew pot in Madagascar. Just the bushmeat and charcoal exploitation in sub-Saharan Africa alone sinks your apologist argument. A white-tail buck deer will eat your garden in one night, but 10,000 aphids will accomplish the same goal given a few weeks. Okay, so uh, we are going to now get into the white tail buck versus aphid analogy that I use to uh, <clears throat> talk about the difference between planet eaters, meaning rich white folks in the U.S. and Europe and Australia. Let's, let's, let's be honest who we're talking about and the rest of the planet. What is the difference between the rich honkies here in the U.S. and the rest of the planet? But before we do, I, I, I just want you guys to understand, as Paul Ehrlich uh, has been trying to explain to people for years when uh, talking about this whole pointless overconsumption versus overpopulation debate, let, let's get it clear what the most overpopulated country on planet Earth is, that would be the United States of America is the single most overpopulated country on the planet for the reason that uh, per capita 
every one of us consume, you know, whatever. Pick your country and do your math. Uh, so make no mistake about it, I fully understand what the most important, the most important, uh, the most overpopulated country on this planet is, is the United States. Thank you, Paul Ehrlich, for explaining to this. You can listen to my interview with Paul, which is the very first interview ever on Collapse Chronicles, back when I used to do interviews, and let Paul Ehrlich explain the concept to you. Okay, but now, with that disclaimer out of the way, all right, should I do the whitetail buck aphid Okay, we'll develop that and then we'll come back and get into my broken record rant about the difference between the carbon footprint and the ecological footprint that people cannot understand the difference. But first, let's talk about planet eating versus planet nibbling. Okay, so planet eaters, which would you know, planet eaters, I, you know, compared to a white-tailed buck deer getting into your garden at night. This is why we have deer fences around our gardens. So you have your little garden, your little Garden of Eden uh, out there, um, which we will call Planet Earth. Well, at least at one point, Planet Earth was Garden of the Garden of Eden. So you have your little garden out there, like I do, about 200 feet from where I'm sitting, and you plant everything out there, and <clears throat> one white-tailed deer, and there's usually not one, there's usually like three or four of them, get into your garden, and one night they will eat your planet. Uh, they will consume per capita, each deer will, you know, one deer could take out an entire, I don't know, row of your baby pole beans, for instance. Okay, those are planet eaters. Those are people like me and you, anyone listening to this, any honky uh, in the U.S., Europe, Australia, uh, Canada, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, if you're listening to this, you are someone like me. I have reduced my own environmental carbon footprint by about 90% uh, in, in the last 12 years, and I'm still one of you. <coughs> anyway, so on the other, so that is the planet eater, and on the other end of the spectrum, I've always used the analogy aphid, but I'm going to change it to slug uh, after being victimized by the slug invasion here in uh, upstate New York. And when I'm talking slugs, you know, I used to think of slugs as some big ass nasty looking thing. I'm talking these tiny little slugs. They're this big. They're about a half inch long. Good God, I have never in my life uh, had my garden so attacked. I, I pretty much had to replant my entire garden, or, or the vast majority of it, when this army of slugs uh, just pretty much took out my garden and, and pro you know, in the space of a couple of weeks before I got a uh, hand on the situation and now these things called flea beetles are, uh, I haven't had aphids yet, but these little slugs, flea beetles, whatever, where each individual slug Okay, each individual slug, or we can call it gypsy moths. Anybody uh, unaware of the gypsy moth invasion up here in New York and New England, where you're driving along seeing entire mountainsides defoliated. It's not giraffes out there. It is these little bitty caterpillars. There's just billions of them taking out entire mountainsides 
here in uh, right around here this summer. These are planet nibblers. These are the sub-Saharan Africans and all the rest uh, of the usual suspects. Um, you know, little by little, uh, being humans, they have to eat. Okay, it's that simple. But you say that if you're a white guy, if you're one of these white, rich Americans like me living in my 384 square foot shack uh, here in, you know, that I share with two other people. Uh, but, it, but if you're a honky, particularly with a southern accent, pointing this out, you are, you know, you're just a racist, you are, all the, you're a eugenicist, you're a racist, what else am I for pointing out that with no help uh, from the rest of the planet, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa will take down every single fellow Earthling in Sub-Saharan Africa from the planet nibbling effect. All right, what people, you know, as I pointed out in that comment, just look at the bushmeat trade. Good Lord. And the, and the other one that, of, of course, Manga Bay, the only one pointing this out, is the charcoal trade. It is charcoal the number one driver of deforestation in sub-Saharan Africa is not lumber for rich honkies in the U.S. and Europe. More and more it is becoming palm oil, but right now palm oil to feed the appetites of uh, Americans and more and more Chinese people uh, is not the number one driver of deforestation, at least in sub-Saharan Africa. It is charcoal. It is people who do not uh, have access to electricity and natural gas. They need to cook their bushmeat. They need, you can't eat a lemur raw. Well, I guess you could, but lemur for anyone who has ever eaten a lemur knows a lemur tastes much better when it's been boiled in the stew pot. How do you think they're cooking their bush meat? They're cooking it on charcoal. Okay? When, when three out of four human beings on a planet are being born in one area of the planet, you know, I actually visited uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I had the pleasure back when I was 12 years old visiting uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. That was 1972. And just remembering uh, the number of, of just, you know, animals out there. And it just being blown away by the number of, of, of animals just running around uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in 1972. And I also remember, you know, the fellow, the, the dri our driver, he was a great guy, telling me that when he was my age that the number of animals that I was seeing it is a small fraction of the number of animals that he used to see. This is called, uh, it's called baseline normalcy or something like that, uh, which is a whole, which is a whole nother rant. And so today, of course, the number of animals that I saw with my own two eyes in Sub-Saharan Africa in 1972, I think their numbers have been slashed by over 70 percent since I saw them in, in, uh, in 1972, that over 70 percent of them have disappeared off the face of the planet, and this is no coincidence that the collapse in uh, the wildlife populations of Africa is directly relative to the human population exploding. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here, guys, 
I'm guessing that uh, the population and I'm using sub-Saharan Africa as as my uh, you know as my poster child, but you could do this anywhere. Okay, I'm not picking on Sub-Saharan Africa. You could take uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia, or wherever. As the pop, my guess is the population has doubled or tripled. And wow, as the number of humans has doubled and tripled, the number of our fellow Earthlings has crashed, has collapsed by over 70%. Uh, this is not being fueled. Well, some of it obviously is. I mean, particularly the rhino horn and the ivory trade market are being fueled, um, you know, from outside Africa. The, the, but the vast majority of this uh, is due to planet nibbling. People have to eat what are they going to eat when they can't get uh, a food handout from rich honkies? They're going to eat their fellow earthling. Uh, Bill Gady, if you listen to my, I think the last interview I had before I quit interviewing was with Bill Gady explaining this, that the sixth mass extinction uh, is going to be caused by humans eating Every single one of our fellow Earthlings is what is going to uh, is what's going to drive the sixth mass extinction, and and of course it begs the question: when they run out of our fellow Earthlings to eat, what are they going to start eating next? But uh, if you have eight children you're going, and, and if, if you live in a mud hut uh, and you have eight children <clears throat> who need to eat, you're going to eat eight times as much uh, of the local resources. Uh, and you're going, <clears throat> assuming you're going to cook that food, you're going to be chopping down trees for charcoal. It, it is the the local resources. I, you know, I've lived down there in Ecuador and Peru for years. The deforestation that I was witnessing was not being driven by rich honkies in the U.S. The deforestation I was witnessing in Latin America for years had nothing to do with rich honkies in the U.S. or Chinese people or wherever. It was these individual smallholder families, uh, you know, with a yard full of kids, uh, just completely, uh, just completely making a wasteland of their local resources. People do not understand the difference between local and global. Obviously, uh, somebody living in a mud hut, whether it be in wherever, Namibia or uh, Bolivia or uh, who knows, somewhere over there in Southeast Asia, you know, come on. Uh, obviously, these people are not contributing to the global problem of uh, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. But so let's get into this broken record rant as I have had about electric vehicles and whatnot. The absolute misunderstanding between carbon footprint and environmental footprint. People, they, the the media has been so good on, they have been good at educating people about carbon footprints, about how much our lifestyle here in the, I, I am looking at one, two, three gas sucking vehicles from where I'm sitting. You add the lawnmower, the chainsaw, the weed whacker, 
that would make six uh, fossil fueled uh, engines I have within 30, 30 feet of here. Uh, obviously, my carbon footprint is, is not just six times greater, it's probably 600 times greater than someone living in a mud hut, uh, you know, cooking their food, or if they live somewhere where it still gets cold, heating their homes with charcoal, which comes from trees. Uh, th th this is duh. Uh, <clears throat> but the carbon footprint, one more time, guys, a carbon footprint is a subset of an ecological footprint. They are not the same thing. Your carbon footprint is part of is part of your ecological footprint. And the richer you are, obviously, the larger your carbon footprint is going to be. Okay? I am not de denying this from the terms of the, the climate change lens. Obviously, rich honkies have a, have a huge difference in their carbon footprint uh, over, you know, over some planet nibbler. Uh, th 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 this is obvious, but what people forget is people, you can still, you can have zero carbon footprint, but still have, still have an ecological footprint. And every human being who is born has an ecological footprint. Whether or not uh, the carbon footprint portion of the ecological footprint, whether it makes up 1% uh, or 60% is irrelevant to the rest of the ecological footprint. And these planet nibblers, uh, you know, boiling their lemurs over uh, over a charcoal fire, still have an ecological footprint, as does an aphid in your garden. This is why I say ten thousand aphids nibbling away at your garden, just given. Uh, a, a little more time are going to have the same effect on the garden as the white-tailed buck deer eating your entire garden in one night. It, 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 it is that simple. If, if, if carbon emissions had nothing to do with it, climate change is one of nine planetary boundaries. If, if, if climate change were nowhere in the equation, nowhere in the equation, the, uh, the human population, again, I'm just using Sub-Saharan Africa as an example, uh, will take down uh, on an individual little level uh, you know, the cumulative effect of, of billions of people with a small individual ecological footprint will eventually take down this planet. Uh, you know, I need to go and, and revisit that uh, big study that Manga Bay was talking about a couple of years ago about the uh, Congo rainforest in sub-Saharan Africa, the second biggest rainforest after the Amazon, and, you know, basically saying that the Congo rainforest will no longer exist at, in, in 30 years. No one talks about the Congo rainforest. We're talking about uh, the Amazon and Indonesia. Nobody is talking about the second biggest rainforest on this planet. Manga Bay, a couple of years ago, did this long, involved story looking at the Congo rainforest. And if you extrapolate present-day trends, assuming 
that it does not go exponential based on present day trends, uh, just do the math. The Congo rainforest will be obliterated off the face of this planet in the next 30 years. Every single one of our fellow earthlings living inside it will uh, be dead in the stew pot, uh, have their habitat destroyed and gone, and I believe uh, I would have to go back and revisit. I believe they were attributing about 90% of this to planet nibbling, to small holders, whatever word that you want to use for them. Uh, going in there and chopping down. If, if, if you have a billion people and each person chops down one tree per year, for charcoal, to clear land, to grow food, and, and for charcoal, you have one billion more people on this planet, each taking down one tree per year. That is one billion trees per year hitting the ground. That has nothing whatsoever on any level to do with rich honkies uh, in, in the United States. But anyway, I understand I'm talking to myself. I understand that Paul Ehrlich uh, gets it. He has been trying for how many years to explain this to people. I don't know why this is such a difficult concept. Uh, and we haven't even talked about the third head of the snake that Paul Ehrlich always reminds people, the IPAT. Uh, impacts equals population times affluence times technology. There were three heads to this snake, but uh, we'll have to leave the technology head of the snake for a future rant because uh, I have to go crank up some form of fossil fuel and get out there and do a little bit of planet nibbling here at Bugs in a Jar Farm on this hot, sticky day, say goodbye to the folks. Bye, folks. Get out there and do some planet nibbling of your own while you still can. Bye, guys. I'm getting a little dog. I am finished talking to myself. about doing, trying to eliminate some of your fellow earthlings from Bugs in a Jar Farm too.